today we are privileged with the presence of a very famous guest from Great Britain. I refer to Mr. Brian Deer, the most distinguished investigative journalist of the United Kingdom from the Sunday Times London, two times awarded with the British Press Award, the most coveted honors in UK media, as well as Doctor of Letters, Norris Causa, given by George St. John University. And he's the author of the book you're saying behind him, The Doctor Who Fooled the World, published last year in September by Johns Hopkins University Press, which is the detailed story of how he unmasked what is considered the most consequential fraud in medical history of the 20th century, the infamous scandal provoked by Dr. former Dr. Edward Wakefield, who changed, fabricated, and misreported the results of his research creating the appearance of a possible link of the MMR vaccine, measles, mump, and rubella vaccine for children with autism. Brian, welcome to Olivera, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for asking me to talk with you. I, I would like to start from the beginning of this long story, but, but you describe in very deep detail in your book, which is it's like a thriller because it, it, it was not possible to turn it down. What uh, did that uh, paper claim and what happened after the, 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 the paper was released and, and made public domain? Well, I'm not sure that uh, many people in Chile would know this, but um, this particular paper that was published in the Lancet Medical Journal, which is probably the second most prestigious medical journal in the world, this yeah. was the acorn from which the modern anti-vaccine movement uh, grew and is the paper that really allowed that uh, campaign to win uh, supporters, uh, set up the infrastructure of the businesses and the uh, websites, the uh, Facebook pages, uh, by which they're now campaigning uh, against vaccination against uh, the coronavirus. Um, this paper was published in February 1998, a long time ago now, what it essentially claimed to do was to claim to report on 12 children, just 12 children, uh, 11 boys and one girl, who were brought to a London hospital. And the paper claimed that the parents of these uh, children, in two out of three cases, so uh, eight of the 12 children, their parents said that they taken their child to be vaccinated and within 14 days, specifically two weeks of vaccination with the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, a three in one shot, which is given all over the world. Within 14 days, their child had shown the first symptoms of autism. Um, and uh, this paper was given a press conference and aroused enormous interest in the United Kingdom and led to a great deal of publicity, which then crossed the, to the United States and from the United States to uh, the whole of uh, North and South America and indeed all over the world. The idea that there was a link between the administration of this vaccine and the development of autism in children. So that's what it claimed to say and that's what set off really the, uh, the uh, anti-vaccine campaigning that we've been seeing in the decade since. In that report, you also revealed something that was a secret deal of Wakefield and a Norfolk lawyer, Richard Barr, was not disclosed neither to the Lancet nor to the co-author of the paper. Yes, one of the first... What did you discover? Uh, one of the first things I discovered was that this this piece of research, it was just uh, uh, a five-page paper, 4,000-word text with uh, two tables in it, um, describing what were claimed to be the uh, developmental or, if you like, psych um, neurological uh, issues of the children, and also issues to do with uh, claims to that they had a, a new bowel disease that, um, that essentially... This project had been commissioned and in part funded, that had been funded and commissioned by
by a firm of lawyers who were hoping to use the publicity surrounding it and the public concerns surrounding it to recruit a great number of clients in order that they could sue uh, the manufacturers of the vaccine, claiming that uh, this vaccine had injured children. Um, so that wasn't known. It, it, everyone thought that this man, Andrew Wakefield, who we're talking about at this London hospital, was uh, a, an objective, uh, dispassionate scientific researcher, when in fact he was a hired gun working throughout for this lawyer who arranged for Wakefield to be paid very substantial sums of money. And those substantial sums of money were dependent on him being able to make a case that would allow the lawyer to bring a lawsuit here in London. Wakefield said that the uh, triple vaccine was causing autism and, and, and he advised the, the parents to apply single measles vaccine, but he also filed a patent for his own. That's right? Yes, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that was a, another of the many, many uh, extraordinary disclosures which, uh, which uh, I was able to force out of him and out of the uh, medical establishment here in the United Kingdom that, that really is the, the, the backbone of my book. Um, yeah, he'd, he'd actually filed eight months before he called on parents at a televised press conference to, to avoid giving their children the three-in-one measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, which is given as a combined MMR shot. He suggested that they should stop doing that and instead give single vaccines, the first of which would be a single measles vaccine, without ever telling anybody that he'd filed for a patent on his own single measles vaccine that would only stand any chance of success if public confidence in the MMR was damaged. Brian, uh, Wakefield was banned of practicing medicine for the rest of his life. Uh, he was uh, in the GMC uh, accuse him of many charges. Uh, you can explain about that. Can't, I can't really remember how many charges there were. It went, on, it went on page after page after page, and it included, for example, uh, financial fraud, uh, research fraud, um, lying to other doctors, um, causing children to undergo uh, a, a horrific week-long series of tests with tubes and needles stuck into them and x-rays done on them and, and all kinds of really horrible things to these children. And, and autistic children, by and large, it's a bit of a generalization, but by and large, they don't, they don't like their lives to be changed very much. They're, they're, they're creatures of habit. And they were brought to this hospital and, and forced to undergo these, um, these tests one child collapsed four times in the corridor. Two other children had to be seen as emergency cases because of the effects of um, spinal taps, lumbar punctures, you know, needles into the spine, which had been um, inflicted on them. And he was charged over that. He was charged over um, uh, carrying out uh, practicing medicine when he didn't have the permissions. He, he was an academic laboratory researcher. He, he had no permissions to do anything with children. The most important part of it was that the study was rigged, uh, yeah. that the, 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 the data behind it had been altered to create the impression that he found the link between the vaccine, autism and bowel disease. After what happened to him in, in England, he was found to continue practicing medicine. He was called dishonest. Uh, he was called uh, unethical or whatever. Uh, I, I, would, I would have thought that he was finished, but it's not the case. He went to the States and he continues doing damage. Uh, after the revelation of your paper, the, the New York Times published an article saying what happened and, and, and that uh, the, the, the Lancet retracted his article. Then Anderson Cooper and CNN made a case of this. But you show that in the beginning of, of the book that he was invited to the opening ball of the President Trump. And it, 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 there is a, a, a picture of him with President Trump in the United States. Well, yes. Uh, the, uh, if you like, when I had finished with him, if you like, with my investigation, um, 
his career was in ruins. And in fact, his career in medicine was over and he's, he's not going to recover from that. But what he was able to do, and I think, it, interestingly, people can probably understand it better now than even, even a few months ago. His first big lie was that I'm working for the drug industry or that I'm working for Rupert Murdoch, who had a scheme to, uh, to destroy him. Then came the second big lie. And this was a lie about other people. What he'd been able to do after he, his career in, in um, medicine was over, he decided that he was going to become a television um, and um, um, television and I suppose film producer. And he made a, um, a, uh, a video uh, in which he claimed that a researcher at the United States Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, which a lot of people have been hearing about in the connection with the coronavirus, that this uh, scientist had alleged fraud at the CDC in uh, research reinvestigating the MMR autism link that Wakefield had proposed. And um, this scientist was, was claimed to have, um, have accused CDC managers of fraud, and he hadn't. He'd, uh, he'd expressed unhappiness with a particular paper that he'd been involved in producing, but he never alleged fraud. And in fact, he made a statement, made a clear statement to Wakefield and others, making it clear that he supported the continued use of the uh, MMR vaccine. But what Wakefield did then, he was able to uh, get media attention for this video, a 90-minute video, which he started traveling around the United States and then sending off to other parts of the world, um, claiming that uh, the CDC was involved in scientific fraud. And it, again, it was another big lie. I, I investigated another vaccine way back. It was a controversy I investigated yeah. in the... In, in the, pertussis, the, the pertussis vaccine. Yes, I investigated a controversy that, that again came from the United Kingdom from another hospital three and a half miles south of the hospital where Wakefield had been working, a controversy over Pertussis vaccine. And um, in that, I, I, what happened was that they had a great controversy took off. But then when it was realized that the anxiety about that vaccine was mistaken, was wrong, the media, newspapers and television run by responsible journalists and producers were able to say, OK, um, we were wrong and move on to something else. But now in this new age of social media, it's not possible for responsible journalists and responsible television producers to, to be able to um, influence the public in the same way because so much of uh, the public's attention has moved on to this peer-to-peer communication that you see on most, most conspicuously Facebook and also YouTube. And uh, I think in Chile, I think there also there's a lot of same WhatsApp. Uh, uh, sorry? It's the same thing. Yeah, but there, yeah. there's a lot of WhatsApp um, uh, communication as well. And in those kind of uh, circles, people who are ignorant, uh, just misinformed, or they've got the wrong idea, picked up wrong pieces of information, or in some cases are uh, liars who actually are actively spreading and intentionally spreading wrong information, they can act really uh, communicating with enormous numbers of people. I saw one the other day, a woman who was a doctor who has been uh, telling people not to, um, not to get the vaccine, not to use masks, that it's all a hoax, that um, the, or the whole, the whole uh, bizarre conspiracy theory that has been cooked up about um, coronavirus vaccines. She got... Um, I think it was 1.3 million viewers for her um, opinions within three days. In three days, I, yeah. I'd never get anything anywhere near that. Their books are all out selling my book, you know, two, three, four to one, um, because those kind of scare stories, those, ki those kinds of ideas, spread much more effectively through the algorithms of social media than does the truth. Um, so we're in a totally different media environment and people like Wakefield and people like Donald Trump are able to exploit that. So 
those kind of films, unlike unlike uh, newspapers, unlike uh, uh, television stations in most of the world, there's no regulatory framework. There's no there's no duty. There's no legal checks. There's no editorial checks on people making videos and and saying anything they like. And uh, so he's um, and this man Andrew Wakefield has been reborn in this world of um, of um, fake news. I only passed that time, but I want to thank you very, very much for this wonderful opportunity of talking with you and congratulate for the favor, really, a great favor you have done to worldwide health, revealing this imposter of Mr. Ex-Dr. Edward Wakefield. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.